So the next topic, which we'll cover this week and maybe into next week, depends on how long it takes, is actually a really big topic, but I've left it towards the end because even though it's a big topic, it's not as widely used anymore as the other stuff we've covered earlier. So things we covered earlier like Rantrant Lock and condition objects and all that other good stuff, those are a lot more common in modern Java practice. But this topic is important and it forms the basis of a lot of the uh, Java concurrency and synchronization since the dawn of time. So it's not surprising that uh, you need to know something about it. So we'll talk about these things called monitor objects. I will explain what they are and I'll show you how it's used to ensure mutual exclusion and coordination between multiple Java threads. And I'll give you a simple human known use of monitors. So let's start by talking about what is a monitor. So a monitor is actually a concept that's been around for a long time. It came out in the early 70s. You can, uh, the, the same year, I think it came out in 1973. Just for kicks, I listed a bunch of hit songs from 1973, which you probably have never heard of most of these songs, but uh, they're all classics. And uh, the monitor provides three primary capabilities to concurrent programs. The first capability is it only allows one thread at a time to have access to a critical section. So it's mutually exclusive. Only one can do it at a time. Other threads end up having to wait if they want to get access to that critical section. They're, they're forced to wait outside. You'll see what that means in a second. The other thing that you can do is that you can um, allow a thread that's running in a monitor mm -hmm. to block until certain conditions become true. So it's a way for a thread that was running in the critical section to kind of park itself off to the side in a, in a waiting room, waiting for a chance to get its turn to run again. And the other thing you can do, which is part and parcel of this, is allow a thread, which is running in the critical section, to notify one or more other threads that the condition or conditions that they're waiting upon have been met. So those are the three main things you get. You get mutual exclusion, and you get notification, and there's two parts of notification. One is to kind of park yourself off to the side because things aren't going your way. <clears throat> and then the other is to notify somebody after you're done saying, hey, that thing you were waiting for, it might be true now. Now that should all sound very similar to you at this point because that's pretty much what you get with reentrant locks and condition objects. But with early versions of Java, they built those features into the language itself. So all objects in Java, keeping in mind what an object is, right? An int is not an object. A uh, double with a lowercase d is not an object. Those are primitive types. But everything that's a so-called reference type, anything that are objects, have built-in monitor objects baked into them. Uh, though that may change if some later version of Java supports value types, blah, 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 but for now, that's the way it works. And as we'll see, there's sort of several types of thread synchronization you can do with these built-in monitor objects. Much as I said before, mutual exclusion, and that's done through these synchronized keywords, either synchronized methods or synchronized statements. And the way that that's supported under the hood is that all Java objects have one and only one so-called intrinsic lock, one intrinsic lock per object. There's not one intrinsic lock for all objects. There's one intrinsic lock for each object that's associated with that object. And that plays the role of what's called an entrance queue. And we'll see that Java's execution environment, such as the virtual machine, supports mutual exclusion internally to the virtual machine via this entrance queue, which is part of the intrinsic lock and synchronized methods which are used to coordinate how that entrance queue is used. So that's one thing. <laughs> we'll talk a lot more about that. The second thing it has is coordination. And that basically is just a feature that's built in to ensure that computations run at the right time, in the right order, and under the right conditions. So those are part of the coordination capability. And we'll see as we get through this that Every Java object, which is a monitor object, also contains a wait queue in addition to its entrance queue. And there's a 
this isn't a widely used term. I just use it because it's consistent with intrinsic lock. It's also got a, an intrinsic condition, one and only one intrinsic condition that's associated with the uh, object, and that's what the wait queue uses. And Java's execution environment, like the virtual machine, supports coordination via this wait queue and the various methods on it to do wait and notify. And we'll talk more about that. Now again, that should sound very familiar because that's not unlike what we talked about before. An intrinsic lock is sort of like a reentrant lock. Not quite, but it's sort of like one. And a wait queue, or the, the intrinsic condition, is kind of like a condition object. Not exactly, but sort of like that. And so those things should be familiar to you at this point. And these mechanisms that are baked into Java the language, as opposed to Java the class libraries, implement a variant of the so-called monitor object pattern. And you can read about that pattern here. That was a pattern that I wrote up years ago. It's part of the POSA 2 book. And it explains how all this stuff works. And the intent of the pattern is to make sure that only one thread runs within an object, i.e. mutual exclusion. And it allows the object's methods, like these guys, m1, m2, and so on, to cooperatively schedule their execution sequences. In other words, coordination. So that's what the pattern is about. OK, so what's a human known use of this? So this, this is sort of a somewhat a contrived example, but it gets the point across. So you can imagine some kind of operating room in a busy hospital as being sort of like this example. Uh, hopefully, you haven't spent much time in operating rooms. And if you have, hopefully, it's been for something like a, a broken arm or something like that. But at any rate, here's the idea. You come along, and you want to get operated on, or someone in your family is going to be operated on. So you start by coming in and checking in. right? You show up, and you say, hi, I'm, I'm here. Here's my, you know, my medical card and my ID and maybe a chart or something, whatever it is that they use to check you in. And so at that point, if there's already someone being operated on, you'll probably have to wait in the check-in room. And I'm sure if, even if you've never gone to an operating room, you've been to the doctor or the dentist or whatever. And so you've got a waiting room. So you're going to wait in the check-in room. Before you even get in to see anybody, you're going to kind of wait if there's already somebody who's being served. Once the operating room is available, then you get to go in. And let's say, for sake of argument, that there's only one operation taking place in an operating room at a time for a variety of reasons. Maybe it's because the number of surgeons. Maybe it's for hygienic purposes. You don't want to have uh, germs commingling between different patients. Who knows what? But there's only one operation taking place in the operating room. So one model is you come in, you, know, you, you check in. It's your turn. You go in. They go and uh, operate on you. And the operation doesn't take very long. It's a success. And then you leave. So you're out. You're done. But let's say that there's either complications or your operation requires multiple stages. And so the operating room is a very valuable resource, right? You want to keep that as busy as you can so the doctor or doctors can do their thing. So if your operation can't all be done in one fell swoop, they're going to move you out of the operating room into a waiting room while you're maybe recovering, or they're waiting to get another specialist in, or whatever, right? There's some reason you can't finish the whole thing in one fell swoop. So you get parked off into a waiting room, and then they might bring other people in. They can operate on them, let them go if they get finished. Or if they can't be finished, they get parked in a waiting room. So at any given point in time, there's only ever one operation happening. And the patients are either coming through, checking in, and then leaving, or getting shunted off to a waiting room. And then once whatever they're waiting for, you know, maybe a specialist had to fly in from the Mayo Clinic, you had to wait for some more blood to show up, or you had to wait for the results of a lab test, whatever. Then when there's nobody else in the room, the doctor will select somebody to come back in from the waiting room to do their thing. But there's only ever one patient in the operating room at a time. Other ones are either coming in and leaving or waiting in waiting rooms. OK, so that's the. The basic metaphor, sort of think about that as the, uh, the high level human known use of monitors. So now that you know a little bit about what a monitor object is, let's motivate why you might need one. And we'll also use this as an excuse to talk about a few other concurrency problems, some of which you probably know at this point, but we'll review them. So to make this point clear, we'll 
have a particular example, which I call buggy Q, which is going to be buggy, as the name implies. And if you were to happen to call the methods on buggy Q, offer and pull, in multiple threads, it'll end up corrupting the internal state of the buggy Q fields because they're not properly protected. So if the consumer and producer are called at the same time, bad things will happen. And then we'll also talk about some of the more general class of bad things that can happen with uh, concurrent programs. So this example, the buggy Q example, is a concurrent producer-consumer app, which you can actually download if you want to actually run buggy code just for fun. And it attempts to pass messages between threads using a queue that is not properly synchronized. So of course, it's going to do bad things. Uh, the actual buggy queue itself is model on the Java array bounded queue class. So you should be familiar with, uh, maybe passingly familiar with this. It's a, it's a class in Java that will allow you to be able to uh, insert and remove things properly between multiple threads of control, because it is synchronized correctly. Our implementation leaves out the important piece, the name of the synchronizers. And so if you go and take a look at the code, you'll see that we have we implement the bounded queue interface, so it has all the methods for the bounded queue. But our buggy queue, and this is sort of a slay of hand, it's an evil slay of hand, it implements this interface that appears to support synchronized access, but we're going to leave all the synchronization out. So you think at first glance it's going to work, but then of course it's actually buggy. So here's what it's going to do when we use it. You're going to have a main program that's going to make the test. It's going to create producer and consumer threads and a buggy queue object. So you can see it'll say new, 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 create all these objects, start, start, consumer threads running, producer threads running. And then the producer thread is going to sit here and offer, in other words, try to put stuff into the queue. The consumer thread will sit here polling, pulling stuff out of the queue. And the buggy queue is going to be buggy. So it's just going to do strange things. And the reason this isn't going to work, as we'll see in a second when we look at the code, is the methods aren't synchronized. So chaos and insanity will result. And when you run this thing, it'll, it'll blow up with strange errors. OK, why is that, you ask? Well, the reason is that even though it implements the interface, an interface just defines the methods. It doesn't give you the implementation, at least not generally, unless you have default methods, but even that won't save us in this case because there's no fields in an interface, no non-static fields at least. So here's what this thing does. As you can see, buggy queue implements bounded queue, but it's actually not really implementing the semantics properly. We uh, go ahead and make ourselves a linked list, which doesn't have any synchronization in it by default, right? And then we have offer and pull. And notice how neither of these methods are synchronized. So we don't have the keyword synchronized here. We don't have a synchronized statement inside. So when this code gets called in multiple threads to add and remove items from the queue, bad things will happen. And anybody who's ever watched the Lost in Space, remember the robot from Lost in Space, you'd say, danger, danger, Will Robinson, danger. So if you ever see code like this that is called in multiple threads and there's no synchronizers in it, it's danger. And uh, let's take a look at what will happen when we actually try to do this. So the question is, when we run this program, what will the output be? And more importantly, why will the output be what it is? And if you run this thing, you know, you'll get different bugs and different platforms and different phases of the moon. But it'll probably look something like this. So in this case, when I ran it on my, program, on my um, laptop, I got a Java null pointer exception because we were trying to remove something from an empty queue, which of course will blow up. Uh, and then obviously it depends on a variety of things. It may blow up, it may hang. What'll, whatever will happen will not be what you want to have happen. Um, and the reason why that's the case is that these methods have no synchronizers. And if you were to take a very careful look at the documentation for linked list, it says in big bold letters, note that this implementation is not synchronized. So if multiple threads access a linked list concurrently, and at least one of the threads modifies the list structurally, like 
removing or adding things to it. It must be synchronized externally. And then it defines what it means to structural, make a structural modification. OK, so bad news, big problem. You'd be surprised at how much code looks like this in real world. So what makes this hard? Well, it makes it hard because um, most problems in the real world don't actually behave as nicely when they fail as this program. This program blows up. So you're like, ah, it blew up. Great. I better debug it. Oftentimes, you'll get strange results. And then you're like, hmm, what happened? And why do I, how do I fix it? If you take a look at this Stack Overflow article, it'll give you some tips on how to debug programs. There's various problems. One problem is deadlock. I think I mentioned that before. It occurs when two or more competing actions running in two or more threads are each waiting for the other to finish, and thus none ever do. So as you can see here in this example, we have thread T1 and thread T2. Thread T2 owns lock L1. Thread T2 owns lock L2. But thread T1 needs lock L2, and thread T2 needs lock uh, L1. And so they're in what's called the circular embrace, or deadly embrace. Both of them refuse to give up what the other one needs. Another problem is starvation. And that occurs if a thread is perpetually denied the resources it needs to get its job done. So you might have a bunch of threads. And some of these threads may be high priority threads. There may be some threads that are running. And then there's some poor thread that doesn't have as many priorities or has higher priority than the other threads. And it never gets a chance to run. So it starves. Uh, this is also a bad thing uh, in most systems. Race conditions, we've talked about that before. That occurs when the behaviors, proper behavior of a program depends on the timing or the order in which the threads run. And then there's also problems with uh, tooling. Whenever you have concurrent programs, it's very hard to debug them because Chances are, the bugs in your code will occur differently when run in the debugger than when not run in the debugger. Because when you run it in the debugger, the order of execution or the rate at which things are running will be modified. So as a result, it's really hard to tra tra track it down. Those are sometimes called Heisen bugs because they change when you start to look at them, like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Some of these problems. Not all of them, but some of them can be, apply, can be fixed by applying condition objects, or rather the monitor objects, which have the condition and the entrance queue under the hood. There are also a bunch of other techniques that are useful to think about when you debug concurrent software. Take a look at this article. For a sense of those, I'm not going to cover them all in great detail now. But um, the point is that monitor objects will help you with some of the issues, most notably, as we'll see next time, synchronization and coordination.